Welcome and good morning. I think we're going to get started here because I know we all have other things to do in uh, the rest of the day. Everybody's got appointments or Bocce's going to dry off. So welcome, welcome to this meeting today. Um, I'm s it's really great to see all of you here. This is going to be an informative and fun morning. Lots of info, but no quizzes, so you're safe. And I just want to do a brief intro to today's speakers in case you don't know them, but I'm finding out that I think everybody knows everybody here. You're going to be meeting Michelle Fortune. She's the CEO of St. Luke's Hospital. She spoke here prior to COVID, the shutdown, and I know some of you were not living here at this time, so she's going to be a newbie for you. Um, obviously, the hospital could not shut down during COVID and the pandemic. <laughs> Michelle, with her staff and teammates, continued to care for all the patients, juggling 12 and 24-hour shifts. Many chases, changes took place during that time, and she will be addressing them in her talk. Then, you, we are very, very privileged to meet Dr. Stevenson and Ms. Hightower, she's also here. Dr. Stevenson is new to St. Luke's, but not new to oncology. This is my first meeting with him, so I'm sure you will be impressed with what is new and available at St. Luke's in the field of oncology. Next, you're gonna meet Amanda Thompson. Now, where do you hear her, her title? Executive Director of Philanthropy and Community Benefit. Try saying that four times fast. <laughs> Uh, and what that means is Amanda leads the St. Luke's Foundation to supply needed equipment through fundraising, and she also writes, I mean, she has many duties, but she writes grants, which are almost always granted, and that to me is just amazing. She will fill you in on her recent activities. And last but not least is Jay Gettings. You might know him. He's local to Columbus. He's a financial advisor, and he's going to give us a brief overview on Plan Guinea. Giving, hmm, I almost said plan gettings. Uh, <laughs> say that one three times fast, Jay. <laughs> Jay is local, he works for Edward Jones, and his office is right down in downtown Columbus. If you have a pet, he's near Pet the Perfect Bark, and if you don't have a pet, he's where you get your egg rolls, okay? Right, that, right in that same place. So please welcome Michelle Fortune. Well, good morning. Um, I'm so glad to be here with you all again. It does feel like a long time. Um, you know, the pandemic has uh, forced us to be in our little hospital silo for um, away from people for a long time. So we're glad to be out and about. Um, for those of you that I don't know, I'll share just a minute or two about my background. And then I want to spend the bulk of my time like any good hospital administrator would bragging on our hospital, right? Um, I am a nurse, have been a nurse for 30 years, and uh, grew up about an hour from Columbus, so I'm a local gal. Uh, lived and worked away for a while in Texas and Colorado, and served hospitals across the country from North Carolina to California before I finally said, I really want to move back home. And uh, three years ago, I was blessed to join St. Luke's and become their CEO. And we have had a lot of growth. St. Luke's is a 25-bed critical access hospital. Um, for those of you that have maybe not experienced our services there, the hospital has lots and lots of things that some critical access hospitals are not fortunate enough to have. A great example of that is our six bed ICU. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the services of St. Luke's, but I want you to see the faces of the people who really uh, are vital to our success, and that is our hospital board members. And you'll see a familiar face there, Linda, who just introduced me and is a friend of many of yours, uh, is on our hospital board. You'll see a couple other faces of folks um, that you know that are here um, and we are so thankful. These men and women volunteer their time. I think one thing that's really unique about our hospital is we are 100% 
locally and independently owned. And that is just so rare anymore. Um, the hospital has been uh, in existence since 1929, and people like these folks have been serving as volunteers to help lend their expertise to the leadership of the organization for many, many years. And so uh, when you wonder who runs things at St. Luke's, this is the, the board of trustees there. Um, we've spent a lot of time over the past two years in the pandemic uh, growing, but part of that has been celebrating our heroes. And you see some pictures here. Uh, during the pandemic, we've tried to have outdoor events for our respiratory therapists and our nurses and our nursing assistants, our physical therapy department. Um, we've had some meals for them. You see a picture at the bottom left where I was down riding on the steps. You are awesome and you are a step above. Um, but we tried to have a number of events just to thank and appreciate our teams. As has been said, um, they have stepped up in ways that are just incredible. I mean, when you have a hospital that's 25 beds and the state asks you to surge over that and you're serving 39, 40 inpatients and volumes in your ED that are two and three times the norm, and nobody can accept any transfers, there are no beds in any hospitals, and your teams work in extra shifts. These are the kind of men and women that you have caring for you, and uh, they really care. So I'm really uh, super proud of our team and what they've done. They've spent a lot of time helping in vaccination efforts. Um, if you've gone to the vaccination clinics in the community uh, or seen about that activity, um, a lot of our team has been there, and you see some pictures here. Um, we've had a lot of thanks from our community, and many of you have written letters of thanks and have encouraged us. That has made the difference for our team during the pandemic. You see the bottom left um, was a tree dedication where someone had donated a tree in honor of our nurses, and we were planting it. So uh, our survival and our thriving through this pandemic has largely been because of people like you who've encouraged us and have said, keep going. Thank you for what you're doing. We appreciate it. Um, I talked a little bit about the fact that we've grown in the pandemic. Um, we've gotten a lot of awards and recognition during the pandemic, and uh, we're, we're now in the number one position for the region in outstanding patient experience, and that's according to the national firm Health Grades. You may uh, be familiar with them. You can see at the chart on the right how others in the region have scored uh, compared to St. Luke's, and we're really proud to be that green uh, in the front. Um, for the past three years, we've received outpatient, um, outstanding patient experience awards from Health Grades, and we actually rank in the top 15% of the nation. That's something to be really proud of. We're also one of only seven hospitals in our state to earn the coveted CMS five-star patient experience award. Uh, so we're proud of that. It's a really hard uh, award to win, and we're thankful to have uh, been granted that acknowledgement. Uh, we've focused a lot this past year not only on trying to care for patients who have COVID or preventing and fighting against COVID, but we've also worked to grow our services. So we spent a lot of time listening to you, our community, to say, what do we need to add so that we can give you better health care? Uh, you see on the top left, uh, we have grown our general surgery program. I think last time I was here, I shared with you all that we had a brand new general surgeon, Dr. Winkle. Um, we have now grown that program, and on the right, Dr. Emily Delmas is a new second general surgeon. So we now have two brand new general surgeons that are serving our community. Uh, on the top left is Dr. Barry Boddy. Uh, we added a urology program. So right in the middle of the pandemic, we launched a brand new service for urology. We bought all brand new cutting edge urology equipment and brought on Dr. Barry Boddy, who had formerly been the chief of surgery and urology at another local uh, large organization. So we were successful in recruiting him to come here. Uh, in the middle, you see um, our pain program has really grown and developed. I think we've added a lot of services there, uh, and we've been really thankful to have comprehensive pain 
come in. Uh, we actually have three physicians that now rotate through comprehensive pain. Uh, we used to have uh, a group that came out of Charlotte, uh, and they provided pain services to us. Uh, but Dr. Ed Lewis, who you see in the middle, uh, they service comprehensive pain, serves uh, UNC Pardee, they serve uh, Advent Health Hendersonville, and now St. Luke's. So the same doctors that you see up in Hendersonville, you're going to see right at St. Luke's in our pain clinic. We've added uh, all kinds of pain procedures that we now perform both in the clinic and in the operating room. So there's pretty much nothing that you want to be done in pain uh, that you couldn't get the same level of care at St. Luke's that you get at these larger hospitals. Uh, at the top right, obviously, COVID care has been a big part of our past year. And then you're going to hear today from Dr. Stevenson and uh, from Savannah Hightower, who uh, have been the expansion of our oncology program. And I know you're going to hear some exciting things about what they're doing. They have brought a whole new level of expertise. Um, these are professionals that have a long history in research and cancer treatment, and now you get that same care right here in our own community. So we're excited about that. Um, in between the last time I came to talk to you and this time, we made a big change in our emergency department group. And so we brought in, we contracted with UNC Pardee. Uh, their physician group now covers our emergency department. So again, the same doctors that you're seeing when you go to UNC Pardee's ED are the docs that you're seeing in St. Luke's Emergency Department. They work shifts at both. That was a very intentional change for us. We wanted, first of all, to make sure that you and our community had access to board-certified emergency medicine physicians. Uh, the second thing we wanted to be certain of is that when you came to see a doctor at St. Luke's and our volume in the emergency department is, is smaller, that you were seeing doctors who saw all kinds of emergency situations. And for that reason, we, um, we entered into this agreement with Par D so that now the doc that you see today in our emergency department yesterday was working in their ED, and they're seeing lots and lots of things that we maybe only see rarely. They see them every day. So the same standard of care that you're going to get if you drive up the mountain, you're going to get right now in our emergency department with probably a much, much shorter wait. So um, we're really, really proud of that. Um, they've been with us a year in April. Uh, the feedback has been exceptional. People have been really, really pleased, and I think they've done a great job. You see Dr. John Benford there on the bottom left. He is the lead physician, uh, works at both places, but is the lead of the group for our site, and we're very, very thankful to have him here. Uh, we also installed 3D mammography, which was just an exceptional moment for us. Many of you helped us make that possible, and we're so grateful. Um, for many, many years, we had 2D, and I, like many of you, went and had my mammogram there on 2D technology when I knew, really, 3D was the cutting edge. We now have 3D. We can do stereotactic breast biopsies. We now have a huge opportunity to be the breast center of excellence here in this region. And I know Dr. Stevenson, Savannah, will probably talk more about that again. We can do everything for you. Uh, if there are services we don't provide, for example, we don't have radiation therapy. Dr. Stevenson and Savannah can send you to have that while overseeing your care, and then you come right back to us. So um, we're proud to be able to provide this kind of service and care locally. We've grown our intensive outpatient psychiatric department. We're giving many more treatments there. We also have grant funds that if someone cannot afford to have that treatment, we're able to provide those for them if they don't have insurance to cover it. So we've been really pleased to expand that. Um, we've really expanded our frontline caregiver resilience efforts and then already talked about our volume management. The last thing that I want to talk about today is um, 
The first time that I'm announcing this in a public setting, I know we've sent out a couple emails, and some of you, if you're on our foundation news list, you may have heard this this morning, but we have now uh, recruited a very well-known cardiologist, Dr. Evans Kemp, uh, who has served for many years in Nashville, Tennessee, and is regionally known and nationally respected, is joining St. Luke's as our cardiologist. Uh, this has been a long time coming. I know we've heard from many of you that you wanted us to start a cardiology program here. Uh, currently, Dr. Kemp works for the Ascension uh, Health System in Nashville. Uh, he received his training at UNC and at Duke and then went on to train at Vanderbilt where he practiced for a number of years. Then he went on to lead a group of 70 cardiologists for Ascension in Nashville for about 20 years. Um, and about a year and a half ago, in the middle of the pandemic, Dr. Kemp and his wife, who is a CRNA and is a equestrian, uh, said, we're kind of tired of Nashville. Where do we want to finish out our lives and live? And they did some research and they said, Columbus, North Carolina is the place. So they bought a huge tract of land, a farm uh, for their eight horses, and uh, he is going to be starting with us June the 1st. We are so excited that we can hardly stand it. We're opening up uh, an echo stress testing lab. Uh, Amanda will talk a little bit about the foundation, but we've been successful in securing a number of grants. We're gonna be able to do stress testing on site. We're adding a lot of other cardiology equipment. But this is a gentleman that I will tell you people clamor to see, and now he's going to be right here in our home community. So we're very excited about that. I know at the end we're going to have a time for questions, and so I hope if there are things that I didn't update on that you want to know about that you'll ask. Uh, I'll be around for that, questions during the Q&A or after. But I want to get to um, Dr. Stevenson and Savannah Hightower who are going to come and spend some time with you. Um, both renowned experts in oncology, and I will tell you, I felt like it was a dream when we were able to recruit both of them here. Um, Dr. Stevenson uh, still serves in South Carolina at one of the larger health systems there and also with us. And Savannah, we've nabbed her full time. We stole her from them. We're real excited about that. Um, but our cancer and infusion clinic and our oncology program has become something that you should be really proud of. Our community uh, now can serve people in ways that we never could before. So without further ado, I'm gonna welcome Dr. Stevenson. Thank you. I like to kind of walk around a little bit as I talk, but I always feel like I'm kind of Oprah Winfrey, like, you know, so, but, uh, at any rate, it's a pleasure to be here, finally. Uh, I've been looking forward to this day for quite some time um, to meet all of you. I've gotten to meet a few of you. I've recognized some faces in the crowd. Uh, what a wonderful organization uh, you have here. I've heard quite a bit about it well before coming up here uh, and now getting to see it firsthand. And then, of course, in terms of St. Luke's, uh, it has been a total joy and pleasure uh, to be a part of this organization, uh, and it's truly an honor uh, to be a part of it. I mean, just what Michelle and the Board of Trustees are doing. Uh, I come from a small town. Um, my small town lost its hospital four years ago. I understand what that means to the community uh, in terms of economic development and survival of that community. So. Um, there's a place in my heart that's very special for what you guys are doing, how you're going about doing it, um, and how successful you guys have been. Uh, and so kudos uh, for all that. Um, in terms of cancer uh, and oncology, it's been really um, a joy to have a very different kind of um, experience here uh, with Savannah. I mean, it really kind of dropped out of the sky for us. It was divine. Um, in terms of how we kind of wound up here. We were talking a little bit about that earlier, um, but uh, you know, a friend of a friend kind of thing. And then uh, here we are, and it's, this is, I've been here about nine months now. Savannah's been here a little over a year, I guess now. Uh, and Savannah and I worked together for a long time in Greenville. Um, 
and so uh, the relationship that we have and the trust that we have it, it, you know, it's kind of like your second marriage, my wife will say, you know, <laughs> about Savannah, you know. Uh, so I kind of feel like I'm, you know, uh, raised in her twin boys as well. Uh, but, um, but just in terms of, uh, you know, the dynamic and the experience that, that you receive at St. Luke's Infusion Center, uh, we, you know, cancer is very much a very relational experience. Uh, you don't come in, get, get it taken out, and, and that's just sort of the end of it, like a gallbladder or something. It has a, it, it has a, there's a lot more emotional impact to it, and that emotion can, can be a part of a long journey. Uh, and you bring the family along with that journey, and the caregivers, and all the rest. Uh, and so just having uh, a staff that understands that and appreciates that and will walk that journey with you is critically important to the overall patient experience. Um, and then in terms of just the technical piece that everyone kind of focuses on and the interest of like, you know, what's the newest technology and these sorts of things, cancer moves exceedingly fast. <laughs> the field moves very fast. Uh, and, and that's one of the things that drew many of us into oncology is because of that. Um, and so that makes it fun and interesting. Um, and we have gone so far in the 24 years now that I've been doing this, uh, and in terms of you know, what you think of treatment, you know, most people still think of chemotherapy as sort of the treatment for, for cancer patients. And there's still a part and a role for that. But it is rapidly kind of fading into the background as we move into more uh, immunologic type therapies where your own immune system actually fights the cancer versus, you know, us giving chemotherapy to kill the cancer. So your body does the work. And that's been one of the holy grails of oncology for over 100 years. And then the other is the molecular component. So this whole field of genomics and how do you incorporate genomics into treating uh, patients? Because not all cancer is the same. So a lung cancer patient in one person may be very different than a lung cancer patient in another, and therefore understanding how to treat that patient versus one size fits all, which is sort of where we've been the last 20 years or before. So that's really unique and, 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 and fun, and, and that's sort of what we, I think, bring a little bit to the table maybe is, is, is some of that expertise and some of that knowledge and then developing programmatic support in terms of how to get those kind of things done. But, you know, on the flip side, you know, we know who we are and we know who we're not, and so, you know, but we know the people who do things that we can't do uh, or that we don't want to get into. And, and, and so having that kind of relationships with trust in individuals who can do things uh, is a very important part because it is a team effort, uh, you know, in terms of how we approach uh, oncology. It's very multidisciplinary. But ultimately, we're here to serve this community. Uh, and this community does not need necessarily always be traveling 30 and 50 miles up and down hills. And I'm just learning some of these roads. And, some are good and some are not. And so, you know, I mean, I kind of think of my own father who's now, you know, he's almost 90. Uh, and what would it look like for him to have a disease that is very treatable, uh, but is having to drive 30, 40 miles? You know, how is he going to get, you know, back and forth, transportation, all those kinds of things? Uh, and so having this uh, cancer center, you know, literally four miles from here, uh, I think, you know, is, is an incredible value to this community uh, and, and to you guys in particular. Uh, so we just want to know, let you know that we're out there and, and that uh, we're, uh, we're doing uh, some fun things. Lastly, if I could, um, so the foundation, man, they just, they just knocked out of the park with this 3D uh, mammography, you know, because when you come here, you're a little not sure, you know, the technology and are you, you know, can you trust the people around you, right? I mean, that's a big part because we said this is much a team effort. Uh, and so, boy, that's just, 
the saws right away is, I mean, we, we had the 3D, like within three or four months, you were almost there, you know? And so uh, stepping up to the plate as, as was done, having that technology available has now opened another door. And that door is the breast cancer prevention clinic. And so just as a little, and you'll hear a lot more about this in the months to come, but so, you know, one in eight women develop breast cancer, one in eight. All right, uh, and so that's ridiculous. Uh, and so, you know, we know, and we already know this, it's, we can reduce the risk of breast cancer by 40 to 50% with some intervention. Uh, but you gotta know who the people are that need the intervention. And so you're gonna see on your mammography reports and things as they come forward in the near future, you're gonna be seeing a little line on there and so the idea is like what is your score so your mammogram is normal and that's great but that's not enough uh what is your score and we'll we'll talk about that at a different time but it has to do with thresholds and if you're over certain thresholds then there may be some additional things that can be done to intervene on your behalf so that you never wind up being in in our clinic being treated for breast cancer um and your family members as well. So that's a big deal. Uh, lung cancer prevention, I doubt anybody in here smokes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're in North Carolina and South Carolina, and so there's still a lot of, you know, smoking that goes on. So there's this whole uh, venture of prevention and lung cancer prevention and early detection. And that will kind of be unrolled as well over the next year uh, with low dose CAT scan availability covered by insurance once a year for the sole purpose of early detection um, in high-risk patients. So these are the things that we want to sort of bring out to the community because ultimately preventing cancer uh, is really where we would like to be <laughs> in the business of rather than treating all the cancer. So anyway, a lot of fun, exciting things. Uh, we're looking forward to continue to grow uh, with you in the community and uh, hopefully you know, COVID may be starting. We've said this three or four times now, but maybe it's finally starting to fade away uh, and we get to learn to live with it and just move on with life. Um, I, I just want to, Savannah, you mind waving? Uh, Savannah Hightower, uh, so she's an amazing nurse practitioner with years of experience, uh, despite her youthful age, uh, youthful looks, um, and, uh, and she's a critical part of the team as well, so. Anyway, thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. And Amanda, I think I'm going to turn it over to you next um, for a few words. Good morning. We are so excited to finally be able to come here in person. I know I recognize a lot of your names on my emails, and I've never been able to meet you face to face. So thank you for coming today. Let me get your mask. <laughs> Um, a little background about myself, um, I, like Michelle, I'm also a registered nurse by background. I have been a nurse for 16 years, and I came to St. Luke's Hospital two years ago um, to be their grant writer and to apply for a lot of grants to get new medical equipment in to help grow service lines at the hospital. Um, it's been a great, rewarding job to be in, to get to give back to the clinical team at the hospital. Um, I came to the foundation last summer to be the executive director and have really enjoyed getting to know the community more. Um, we do have some of, my, some of our board members here today. Um, ben Ellington is in the corner. He is our foundation board chair. Um, Scott Plune right here is our treasurer. And all of you know Linda Shooter. She is our events committee chair and does a wonderful job with planning all the events. And in the back, um, Linda Greensfelder, um, she helps our resources committee. So a little background about the foundation, if you're not familiar with us, we were founded just about 30 years ago in 1991, and our mission is we support um, projects at St. Luke's Hospital. Um, the donations you give to us go back to your community hospital. 
and that's very important so we can do um, special programs, especially like 3D mammography. Many of you in this room were key to us being able to finish that campaign so quickly. Um, we also have an endowment fund, and that endowment helps grow for many years that can support St. Luke's Hospital well into the future. And you may ask, well, why, why do we need to give to the foundation? A lot of people assume hospitals are just making billions of dollars, and we, <laughs> we have all the funding needed to buy new equipment. But by giving to the foundation, you're ensuring that your local hospital that's so close to here is here for many more years to come. Um, according to the UNC Shep Center of Research, since 2010, 135 rural hospitals have had to close their doors. That is something we never want to see here in Polk County. We love that minutes away you can get top quality care without driving up a mountain or far distances. And so when you give to us, we can keep meeting the needs of our community and our patients and our staff. And I know we've talked about 3D mammography a lot already, but we were very excited to bring this here. Um, we raised almost $600,000 to be able to start um, this 3D mammography program. That's thanks to many of you. Um, we received many regional foundation grants, almost 150,000 in grants went to the project. And then many of our local churches and businesses um, also gave. And like they said, we're now able to perform the stereotactic breast biopsies. That's something before, if you needed that, you had to be referred out to a larger hospital system. And then once you went to that larger hospital, you often stayed there for the rest of your care. Now you can get everything you need at St. Luke's. And we've also seen a 50% increase in volume. When we had 2D mammography, on average, we were doing about six mammograms a day. We're now doing 12. And we've recently received some funding where we're gonna be able to provide free 3D mammograms to the uninsured in Polk County. Um, this is funds we're gonna have available for many more years to come. Um, we're just starting this next month and we'll be offering these the first Thursday of each month that afternoon. And we're about to send out mass communication to the community and the different social organizations that help the uninsured. So we're very excited um, to be able to do that. And then we've had several other recent um, donor supported projects. Another big one that was going on at the same time as 3D mammography is we were able to renovate 18 patient rooms. If you've ever been at St. Luke's Hospital as a patient, or had a loved one, this is the main hallway of rooms. We call it the medical surgical hallway. There's 18 of them, and these rooms really needed a facelift. They had wallpaper, outdated flooring. It just, you know, it looked a little depressing. <laughs> and we wanted to, you know, make it look more modern, um, clean, and inviting. If you have to be a patient, you want to be, you know, in a nice room. And these rooms look fantastic now. Um, just last week, we were able to install the donor recognition plaques in the hallway to honor um, those who gave. And it has taken a little bit longer than we initially wanted to get these rooms finished. But as you know, with COVID, the construction and supply chain issues made it go a little longer. And we've had so many patients the last two years, of course, we have to close these rooms down to be able to renovate them. So we had to do them very slowly, a little bit at a time. We have two rooms left, and then we'll be completed. Um, your funding also helped purchase CPR mannequins and a training defibrillator for the staff. Um, if you've ever had to take a BLS class, these mannequins are very neat that they light up green to tell you if you're doing compressions correctly, if you're giving the breast adequately, and that's important. So in a real life code situation in the hospital, you know the staff have been trained to do the um, CPR adequately. Also, um, just recently, these items have been purchased just in the last few weeks and months. 
We've ordered 23 new patient overbed tables. Um, with our increased census, we need to, needed to make sure all the rooms had these. And you know, if you're a patient in the hospital, you really want to be able to eat your meal comfortably in your bed and have your belongings close to you. So we'll have new tables. Um, we also ordered a vein finder. And I don't know if any of you are like me, I have the worst veins possible. And maybe it's because I'm a nurse, but nobody can ever start an IV on me or draw blood. But with this vein finder, the staff is able to put it over the arm and your veins will light up. So you, you may not be able to see it to your naked eye, but this will really help. And you know, being a smaller hospital, we do not have a 24 seven IV team on standby. Um, you have the people that are there working that day. So this is a tool that our staff have, have asked us that it would help them in their role. And so hopefully if you're ever a patient, when we receive this um, new equipment in, hopefully you will not have to get stuck multiple times if you're one of the people like me that have no veins. <laughs> it's no fun. Um, we've also, we're gonna upgrade our ER security camera system. Um, through the pandemic, we have seen more patients suffering from mental health complaints, um, at times violent patients, and we wanna make sure we're keeping our staff safe. And so this system will allow them to monitor a patient safely without having to sit right in the room with a violent patient. So this is also something our staff have wanted to have. And lastly, um, teammate appreciation. You know, our, the St. Luke staff, they have worked incredibly hard over the past two years. Many working extra shifts, many stepping in to work in roles that are not their own. Let's say we have EVS people that are out sick. We've seen even our CEO out there cleaning stretchers. It really says something at St. Luke's. We all pitch in to help each other out. And so we wanted to give back to them. You can see on this picture, this was a fun day we did in December. We had something called the 12 days of joy because we were trying to bring joy into the workplace and every day was a different theme. And this day was a hot cocoa bar with all the toppings. And it was really the first time we've gotten together in a while. So everybody was very excited um, to have some fun at work. This is just to show um, quickly, and we have brochures on the back table about our giving levels at the foundation. One of our most popular ones that many of you are familiar with is our Palmer and Jervy Society. This is donors that give $1,000 or more annually, and we always have a big gala in November. Unfortunately, we have not been able to have this party for two years now due to COVID, but last year was a, we tried to think of a fun alternative and many of you participated where we called it Gala at Home. And we used our same vendors that we were gonna use if we had the real party and we made little gift baskets up to where you could bring the gala safely into your own home. And we hope those that participated that you enjoyed that. Um, we also offered our donors to give their baskets back to a hospital employee, and we had 38 hospital employees get those gift baskets, and they were just blown away that people in the community would think of them, and they were so excited to get that surprise. Um, we also have something called the Heritage Society, and it's something we're wanting to let people know about more. Um, this society is when people let us know that they have made portions of their estates, either through a bequest or a will, that is set aside to benefit the hospital. Um, the great thing of letting us know, you know of that in advance is we can recognize you and honor you for making that commitment to us. Um, we are wanting to keep a log of individuals that fall into this category, and we're gonna start having an annual celebration to celebrate you. And we feel the more people in the community hear your story that you're planning to give back one day, it will encourage others to do the same. And some ways you can get involved that are very fun for the women in the room, sorry guys. Um, <laughs> 
We have something called the Women's Ambassador Group. Uh, we relaunched this group last July, and the purpose of this ladies group is for you all to come together. Uh, we bring a presenter to tell you about a service line at the hospital, and then we ask you to be able to go out into the community and tell your friends about what all is happening at St. Luke's Hospital and that you support the hospital and the foundation. Um, last July, our focus was on 3D mammography. And at that time, we, were, we still needed about forty to $50,000 to close um, that project. Um, that event helped close that project, thanks to the ladies um, that came, hearing about the need, and then stepped up to close it out. And we really appreciate that. We just started planning our next event for May 19th. It's at Parker Benz Winery, so you get free wine and a charcuterie. And the great news is Dr. Kemp, the new cardiologist, is going to come be the presenter. So this group will be probably be the first group, I would say, that gets to meet him and hear from him. So if you're not already a part of this group, um, if you want to see me after or send me an email, um, we'll be happy to add you so we can send you an invitation. And then lastly, many of you probably know about our Ake Around the Lake Festival. That's our biggest fundraiser event each year. It's held at beautiful Lake Lanier in the fall. The date this year is October 22nd. It's a Saturday morning, and we offer a variety of different races. Um, but something we always need is volunteers for that event. It could be as simple as handing out snacks or water to the runners and just or just being there to point, go this way. <laughs> I'm not a runner by no means, and that's basically all I can do and just admire these people that can run such long distances. But last year's race raised almost $21,000 for 3D mammography with 241 people participating. So as you can see, lots of exciting things going on at the foundation. Um, we're very excited about cardiology starting soon. We've already received some grants, like Michelle said, to start echo stress testing. That's something we've never been able to offer before because to do that test, you have to have a cardiologist. So now, um, with the money we've received, we can start that in June. And in the next coming weeks, you'll be hearing more from us on other, another fundraising campaign we're going to start to help support the success of that program. So I just want to say thank you all for your support, especially this past year. And we look forward to being able to do more of these events. Our last presenter is Mr. Jay Gettings. Jay is no stranger to the foundation. He has served, served on our board for a decade, long time. And he is from Edward Jones, and he's a financial advisor. And he's just going to talk briefly about some different plan giving and charitable opportunities. On? How about now? How are y'all doing today? It is really good to see everyone, and I mean that in a physical sense. It's good to be out in public and be able to see people. Um, I was trained as an engineer, so I like facts and figures, and you can respond if you want to. Who knows what percent of the U.S. population gives? What percent of the U.S. population gives? Gives, gives, donations. A lot. A lot. 89%. I was surprised too. 2016 is the last year we have amounts. So the amount that was given in 2016, who wants to take a guess at that? 200 95 billion dollars. So a lot of money has been given. Um, most money is cash dropped in a giving tray, offering, but, but also, you know, in front of organizations. And checks written to uh, charitable organizations that you care about. There's other types of giving. And today I'm going to talk about Plan giving. So plan giving is typically when you put a little bit more thought into your giving, you may be able to, get, be able to give larger amounts, you may be able to get tax advantages. 
And all I want to do today is bring awareness to these opportunities. So, one of the simplest ways that you can do planned giving is to have a good plan. Our plan at the end of our life is usually often a will or naming beneficiaries. So when you move out of trying to state, you want to make sure that your stuff goes where you want it to go. And so naming beneficiaries on any life insurance policies, any retirement accounts, just having an updated will are all great ways to make sure that your money does exactly what you want it to do. For many of us, that includes family members, but for 89% of us, it also includes the charities that we care about. You heard me mention life insurance. So I see two types of life insurance that, that people have when they are older, when they are retired. And I've been a financial advisor for about 15 years now. Um, when, when I see a retiree with a life insurance policy, I'll say, what is this for? And I usually get a story about what it used to be for. I bought this when I was working, and gosh, it only cost me 50 bucks a month. I'm just going to pay for it, keep paying on it, and et cetera, et cetera. When you have an old policy that you still possess, you may choose to update the beneficiaries. And absolutely, your family is a big beneficiary of those, but your charities can be too. So think about beneficiaries on life insurance policies. The other I see is someone who's being very deliberate. They're still healthy enough to get a life insurance policy, and they want to pass on a specified amount to a charity, and they want to pay for it over time. So they may purchase a very specific life insurance policy that goes to the charity of their choice when they are gone. Both are incredibly efficient planning tools, and all of those proceeds are tax-free when they pass to, the, to their beneficiaries. Beneficiary, uh, beneficiaries on IRAs, 401ks, and bank or brokerage accounts. Often overlooked. We let them sit for decades, and we haven't looked at who we've named. So I would just ask you, take a moment, look at who you've named as a beneficiary. If your wishes include a charity, that is another good place to um, add them. This is the one that I find the most opportunity with. If you, it requires a few things. A, you need to have a retirement account. And B, you need to be 70 and a half or older. If you meet those two criteria, and you can do this. Many of my clients take their IRA distribution, that thing called a required minimum distribution. And I say, what do you do with it? And they say, I don't really need it. Or I use it for spending. And I say, are you charitable? And they say, absolutely. I give to my favorite charity every month. And we talk about this, and it helps them out. Sometimes we reach the point where we can't deduct, itemize our deductions on our tax return anymore. So we don't get to deduct a whole lot. Trying to states has some extra benefits where you often can still do that. But you may give money directly from your retirement account to a charity of your choice. The trick is it has to go straight to that charity and not pass through your hands. And when it does that, it never shows up as income to you come tax time. So it's a phenomenal way to reduce your tax burden if you are already charitably inclined. Another tool I see used often is someone who's bought a stock that they like. I use Apple. Maybe you bought Apple, had a, had a wild hair 10, 15, 20 years ago. And you never want to sell it because, you, gosh darn it, you don't want to pay the taxes on it. Another wonderful way to give and receive a personal benefit from that giving is to donate appreciated, appreciated assets. When you do that, you give those to a charity, you do not pay the taxes on the uh, appreciation of the asset. I believe this is the final uh, strategy that I have to share today. Sometimes people want to make a gift in a certain year. They're working with their CPA, they've got some taxable considerations going on 
perhaps they've sold something that's appreciated. And they're charitable, but they want to control taxes, and they also want to make a donation but control the, the money for a period of time. And that's called a charitable remainder trust. You can actually take a chunk of money, put it into this type of trust, take the tax benefit in the year that you give it, and then you still control the money, and your job is to give it away for the rest of your life. And then again, when you move out of Trina States, you want to leave that, the rest of the money to one of the charities of your choice. So this is special. It requires um, uh, probably legal and tax advice also, but it's good to plant that seed and know that it's there if you have a situation that may warrant it. I'll pause here. This is for questions for all of us. So if you have questions about the hospital or any of the speakers, uh, feel free to ask them, and we'll pass the mic along. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Miss Judy. Michelle, would you tell us how much our hospital provides free services because people cannot or will not pay? So each year the hospital does a cost report and we report to the federal government, you know, how much we have given in uncompensated care or community benefit. And that number typically hits around $5 million a year. Um, and that's made up of either people who come in and are underinsured or uninsured and can't pay and or other services that we provide that we don't get compensated for that might be training of medical students or things like that. It's about $5 million a year. So thank you for asking that. It's a big number. There was another question, I think. Thank you. Mine is, I guess, for the oncologist or you. Um, my, not oncologist, I'm sorry, the new cardiologist. And uh, I have recently started going to a cardiologist in Spartanburg. And when I ask about his sending, when I go, my reports and results and everything to my doctor here. And he said there was a time when it was much easier, but he's... We're with Advent now, and there's more trouble in getting the records to them, but it could be done. So uh, would there be a big issue in transferring my stuff to the new cardiologist? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> St. Luke's is actually on the medical record EPIC. Um, I will tell you that most small hospitals are not able to be on EPIC. It was a very large investment that we made, but that is the same that large hospitals are on. It is the leading medical record uh, across the country. We can share information easily with any other organization, and they can share it with us because EPIC is a leading platform. So there should not be any challenge with that. Um, and we're happy if, if you have got a specific physician or situation just call us, and we'll walk through that with them because there's Epic Community Care Connect, and information flows really easily. So, no, there should be no issue with that. Another question about Dr. Kemp. Not all cardiologists perform surgery. Does he? Will he? He does not perform surgery. Um, you are very right. Um, Physicians it sort of take two tracks in cardiology. They're either a medical-focused medical cardiology, which is his, structural heart disease, um, uh, all kinds of CAD, CHF, uh, any kind of uh, congenital adult issues, those sort of things. If you needed an intervention, he would send you to a specialist for that intervention and then receive you back to oversight that care. So he works with all of those folks. At this time, we don't have a cath lab, so we don't have interventional radiology, so we wouldn't be placing stents or things like that. But we are working on a plan to be able to have gold standard of care to be able to diagnose whether or not you need those things 
with a level of accuracy that would be the highest possible. So more to come on that, but he does not perform surgery himself. Great question. Is Dr. Kemp taking uh, appointments for new patients, or when is that going to start? Y'all have such great questions. Um, yes, he is taking appointments. Dr. Kemp is going to be seeing patients at our Foothills Medical Associates office that's up behind the hospital. We have built and added two new patient exam rooms in that office that actually the construction just got finished this couple days ago. Um, so there are two new office spaces to expand that. We are also discussing him maybe being up in Saluda a day. And so if there is interest there of people to see him there, we already have an office in Saluda and we're talking about him um, seeing patients there too. So yes, we are starting to book appointments for him uh, if, one, if anybody has interest. Yes. Do you have a blood donor program? Okay, great question. Uh, blood donation is wildly important. And, um, and right now, um, you've probably seen in the news, it's been one of the toughest seasons for blood donation. Um, we do have on-site uh, blood donation um, that comes to St. Luke's, and we, we put those um, information requests out. They come about every six weeks. We have a blood bank on site. The good news is if you come and give at one of the donations that we hold on site at St. Luke's, they guarantee that blood to stay in Polk County, and that's wonderful news. Listen, the Red Cross is wonderful, and I've given many times personally at the Red Cross, but the blood connection who comes to us, the reason why we have them come to the hospital is they assure us that blood's going to be used in our county. Um, the American Red Cross, you give, it might come to our county and it might go anywhere else because they're, you know, they're trying to serve people across the nation, which is great. Um, but the blood connection has been wonderful for us because it's made sure that we've got adequate supplies in our, in our blood bank and we have not had any problems while others are really struggling with that. Yeah. <clears throat> for it to be assured that they're going to earmark it for here, yes. Yeah. Now, I will say there have been surges where we have needed more than what was given here in our community, and they've always come through for us. We've always gotten the blood that we needed, which is great. So, yeah, great question. Have you considered working with our director to offer CPR training for us? No, no, but that's a great idea. It's a, gra it's a great idea. You know, we, we actually have not had any sort of community training, but I think it's a wonderful idea. And so we'll go back and talk about that. We um, probably about a year and a half ago, we, we made an investment. Um, we did not have what I will call a nurse educator that was dedicated to educating our team. We, like many hospitals, we had sort of a situation that, hey, somebody has this other job, and on top of that, they're going to kind of do education. And we reached a point where we said, you know, we're trying to do all these more complex things and be more than we've been. We're going to have to step out, and we're going to have to invest in this. And so we brought on a full-time nurse educator that all they do is train people. Um, the person that's in that role is a ACLS and BCLS instructor herself. So I'll go back and talk about that. I think that's a great idea that we might could say, let's have some things for community members where we could give them certification. Great idea. Had not thought about it. I just wanted to make sure I couldn't get those veins to turn green. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's very important. Um, and, you know, I'll go back to the surgical piece of cardiology. You know, we... We never stop dreaming at St. Luke's, and we don't stop working to try to grow. Uh, one of the things that we're doing right now is imagining with the North Carolina Office of Rural Health, 
what the future of rural cardiology could look like. And they're having a lot of conversations with Amanda and I, and, and Dr. Kemp will be part of that. I mean, one of our goals is to get to the point where we expand out and have more than one cardiologist and whatever that program looks like. So I'll say, I'm not closing the door that in the future we might not have to answer your question no. We might be able to answer it yes because we're, we're working to build. So these are very important questions y'all are asking. Even if we go, we don't have it today, that motivates us to think about what the future could look like. Yeah. Other questions? Please. Okay. Uh, I thought that the patient basically owned the medical record and that any doctor's office or hospital was obligated to transfer those records to any physician that the patient needed. Yeah. Is there, is there not a legal no, obligation? you are technically, that's correct. His, his comment about, you know, the patient owns their medical record, it is your medical record. You can ask for a copy of that at any time and they have to give it. Um, so you could go to the medical records department and get your records and send it or fill out the form and have them send. But I think the, the advent of the electronic medical record, there should be that ease of transition where we know what's going on and we're able to look at it and it's there. But yes, there should be no barrier to you being able to transfer that information. Any other questions for any of the panelists?